Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in TradFi, digital assets, technology, and financial planning. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, joined by Chris Engelbert, founding partner and chief investment officer of Engelbert Financial Advisors. We have Tammy Trenta, founder and CEO of Family Financial, Chloe Wolforth, CFP and partner at Angelus Wealth Management, and finally, Todd Stankowitz, president and chief investment officer at Sky On Capital, to discuss how clients perceive the current environment, end of year portfolio and budget strategies, at financial position for 2024 and the next gen advisor and how the industry is evolving and certainly one of the most inter interesting industries that are evolving at this point. I want to kick it off and talk about your macro overview before we get into client perception and how you're working with them. Let's just go around the table. Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, it's been uh, one of the things we've been trying to communicate with clients. It's been a rough two years. I mean, people don't realize that after 2020, 2021 looked great. 2022 wasn't that great, and now 2023 is again a, a disappointment. I mean, unless you're in the Magnificent Seven, your stock portfolio hasn't been performing. Bonds, if they close today, would be down the third year in a row, something that conservative investors haven't seen. But going into 2024, I see a lot more positives on the horizon. Yeah, it almost feels like, Todd, that there's some sort of clarity in the environment right now compared to the start of the year. Uh, you know, I think that people think there's more clarity sometimes, and I think that that's causing part of the problem. Because reality, when we look at the yield curve and we look at what's happening with uh, recession probabilities, they're still out there, but so many people are dismissing that and saying that we're going to have a soft landing or, you know, the worst is behind us, and we're just jumping the gun too much in that respect, right? And what we have to do is we have to recognize that at the end of the day, you know, history rhymes, right? It doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And that yield curve and those recession probabilities have been accurate for roughly the last nine recessions that we've seen. And so at the end of the day, we can't necessarily completely reposition our portfolios off it, but we have to take that in context. And so when you look at that, you have a lot of conversations about trading up in quality, looking for opportunities and short duration bonds, as you said before, right? Fixed income has, you know, could potentially have its third down year in a row, but we have to start thinking about how you manage that front end of the curve more dynamically. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really, at the end of the day, you know, being more creative in those nuanced areas in the market. Yeah, and going around the horn here? Yeah, so we're lucky that a lot of our clients are truly long-term investors, and so, you know, we are thinking really long-term. And so, well, every day internally, we're fixated on what's going on in equities and fixed income. Like you said, um, you know, bonds have been really difficult, and so dealing with um, clients that have bond exposure and how do we manage that volatility, we have been very short duration and continue to be that way. Um, we don't see any reason right now to go further out. Um, and then within equities, we have, um, we are global investors, but recently in the last few years, we have had a home bias, and that is really dictated by um, what's going on right now where, you know, the U.S. is where we see corporate profits and economic activity. And so even with all of this um, difficulty, geopolitical difficulty, volatility, um, we are positioning ourselves that way. And so I'd say while we're internally very much talking about all these things, client conversations are still very much long-term in nature um, and trying to focus really on that asset allocation and, and getting that right um, and focused on how we can stay the course long term. Right. And of course, we'd like yeah. to get your opinion as well. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting what Todd said about history not repeating itself but rhyming because it was in my last newsletter. And you know, for the first time in a long time, I've had clients ask about going to cash. And to me, that just sounds so odd, but um, also have been asked whether you should sell stocks and go into bonds because the yields are so much better now. And I think what people um, forget is that the best times to own stocks are when the market is down so that you can ride those stocks up. And the market does not behave in a linear fashion. So you can't compare bond yields today with long-term stock performance. And so, you know, what are we doing about it right now? Well the consumer is still spending, and that's what's creating corporate earnings. So if that's the case, and, and we see what the consumer's doing, their, their bank accounts are eroding, and they're going into their credit cards. Credit card balances is, are as highest as they've ever been, and late payments are as highest as they have ever been. So, you know, although I'm 
positive for the new year, 2024. I don't know how positive I am, but it's hard to ignore the other shoe dropping. Um, you know, when people who've gotten into a house in the last few years and they have 8% interest rates and there are lenders that are allowing them to put 5% down, what happens? Um, do I think we'll have another 2008? I don't. Um, am I afraid of a recession? No. I think that there's things that you do tactically during those periods. But um, I think that in the long run, you take advantage of dips when they occur in the markets and you've got to get people focused on long term being cautious, lowering leverage, and trying to get rid of all variable rate debt is, yeah. you know, what, what we're What you're touching on, though, is you're seeing leading indicators deteriorate at a pretty rapid pace. Look at housing starts, right, as a primary example of that. And when you see yields where they are, right, your risk-free rate's five, five and a half percent. Right. It starts to be very difficult that you see these leading economic indicators deteriorating. You see recession risks exist. And then you have a five and a half percent risk-free rate to overcome. So how much risk premium are you getting for taking on that excess standard deviation of moving out into stocks or small cap stocks? How does that look? And I think that that's really what the hurdle is. So while we want to keep investors invested on the long term, it's hard to deny the reality that you know, risk-free rates are where they are. Yes. And they may, individuals may not be that far off base with reassessing asset allocations in that respect, at least in the short term. Yeah. I want to jump in on a point that you made. I've heard this a lot about how consumer debt is at all time highs and everybody's worried about it. I think the way people use credit cards has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. I know in our household, we rack up the credit card debt, but we pay it off every month because we're getting the points. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd really like to see when they come out with that blanket statement that credit card debt's at all time highs, I'm like, okay, how much is that carried over 60, 90, 120 days? Because really, is it a smart consumer using credit cards to spend, or is it people living beyond their means? And I think. You know, again, to your point about the deterioration in the economy, uh, I think this year has been the big years of surprises on the upside for the economy. I mean, I remember last fall, everybody was coming in, oh, wow, you know, we're going to have a recession this year, it's going to be bad. We just got done with third quarter corporate earnings, they were up 7%. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody expected that. So, you know, I go back to my thesis that we're going back to the 1980s. 1980s, you had high energy high inflation uh, and high interest rates, one of the best decades for stocks that we've ever had. I think the last two years have been the corporations transitioning to like, what are we going to do going from low interest rates, low energy prices, low inflation to high energy prices, high interest rates, high inflation. And you write about the five, five and a half percent. I keep telling clients, typically what's the most obvious thing to do? Hey, let's put 30 percent of our money or sell me out. I love the mm -hmm. comment where people are like, Get me out and then get me back in when things look better. And you got to like, be right twice. Yeah, you got to be right Statistically improbable. Twice. Yeah, and, and, and that's the toughest thing. And so the point is, uh, you know, you got to stay, to your point, you got to stay in the game. But I think a lot of investors are now getting itchy because they haven't really seen portfolio gains in two and a half years like they impatient. saw in 2020. Right. Yeah. Well, we're also conditioned to an environment where interest rates were so low for so long. I mean, you've got a generation of investors and advisors mm -hmm. you know, in the past 10 to 15 years. You had you know, interest rates essentially around zero, and they're used to seeing stocks go from the bottom left of the chart to the top right. I mean, you have a generation of people who've never experienced this kind of volatility. I will argue, however, Betting against the consumer has been really tough, even though there could potentially be some similarities to what we saw in the 80s. When you have employment at 3.8, 3.9%, mm -hmm. and we're not hearing about any major collapses in sectors yet, uh, I mean, that's, that's always a possibility, and impacting other sectors, it, it's going to be hard to bet against the consumer and against a soft landing if we even have one, because the employment rate, if you want to work, there's a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think to your point, I mean, we saw what happened during the pandemic. Typically, coming out of it, everybody was like, we need to hire more people. And the last mm -hmm. 5 to 10% of a workforce really isn't that. Those are the marginal workers. Now, those are going away. But again, wages have gone up. To your point, you can you know, find a job. And I keep telling people that are forecasting this big recession, maybe the Fed's right this time. Maybe, maybe they do finally get it right. Everybody bets against them that we have a soft landing because if you got two income couples employed and they've got the cash flow, they can support the debt, uh, they can afford the higher mortgage. Now, the, one of the points that I've been making uh, dealing in the institutional world is a lot of people are negative about seven and a half, eight percent mortgage rates. I'm like, you know who's not negative about that? We're talking about defined benefit pension plans. Mm -hmm. Some of our biggest public, public service pension plans in this country have actuarial assumptions of six, six and a half percent. 
they were, they're having a tough time meeting those the last couple of years. Now, they're getting 7.5% on a mortgage. Uh, you're, uh, to your point, you're going to see some shifting. You know, do we go from overvalued equities to a fixed income that meets our actuarial assumption and gets us where we need to be for you know, our, our pensioners? Yeah, let's talk about some end of year strategies for a moment here. I mean, we're only what, six, seven weeks out? <laughs> I, I think that like 2023, and we say this every year, just blew by um, exponentially. Let's talk about some end of year strategies. I, I believe, um, uh, Chloe, in your notes, you had a number of them, particularly around um, philanthropy and giving and thinking about you know, how, how you can unload some of those losses, unload some of those profits. Let's start there. Sure. Yeah, every end of year, it's all about giving, whether it's giving to family, it's giving to charity. Um, it's always the same sort of topic, but then given what's going on in the tax world, it, I feel like the strategies tend to change a bit. Um, the usual suspects, you know, using the annual gift tax exclusion, um, the lifetime exemption amount being so high, um, what is it, 12.92 million per person, almost 26 million a couple. Um, people, and that's set to sunset in 2025, families are really scrutinizing, like what can they give away? Um, and so that's been a topic of conversation. On the charitable front, you know, private foundations, donor advised funds, those are all things that are consistently on the table. I would say that qualified charitable distributions out of IRAs um, have been sort of top of mind more than usual. And I think that really stems from the um, SECURE Act 2.0 that um, has just passed, or sorry, 2020. And part of that is, I think, really this change in how inherited IRA distributions are being treated. And clients with big IRAs are thinking about the next generation. And while it's terrific to inherit a large IRA, you know, how does that impact you if you have to distribute that balance within 10 years, whereas before this um, new change, you had a lifetime to distribute that IRA? And so we're looking at QCDs um, as a way to give to charity um, through your IRA distribution. It's, as you, you all know, um, if you're a 70 and a half, you can start to do that and it's $100,000 max each year. Um, and that can start to really chip away at your IRA balances. And for clients that are charitably inclined, it's a great way to go about doing that. Um, in addition to sort of getting these IRA balances down, it also eliminates that taxable income that happens when, or that you're in, that um, is incurred when the distribution happens with your required minimum distribution. So all in all, these are sort of strategies we are talking about um, and that clients are um, getting in the weeds on and we're trying to make decision on before 1231. Well, you make the case for having a financial advisor because I would never be able to keep all those nuances <laughs> in check. And, and Tammy, uh -huh. on the flip side, you're talking about eliminating debt and best practices when it comes to debt. I mean, it's inappropriate for this conversation as we're talking about higher interest rates and you know more credit card usage. What are you advising as you look into the upcoming year in terms of managing debt? Yes, well, <clears throat> certainly paying down variable rate debt, um, you know, in the financial planning reviews I'm doing. And, and our client base is primarily business owners, so we're very tax focused at the end of the year. But, um, you know, when we're doing tax projections and looking ahead, you know, one, we're trying to help them keep more of what they earn. Um, they're in the accumulation phase of life. And when we're looking towards next year, I think the biggest risk is the leverage and you just never know um, and so like rental properties are hard, it's harder for rental properties to cash flow the biggest concern I see is a variable interest rates like interest only mortgages um, because for a very long time we've had low borrowing rates and people can have a mortgage at 25 cents on the dollar of what it will cost them for a mortgage today and so those are things that I'm really looking at next year just keeping an eye on their leverage and anything that's in an interest only situation looking at their loan documents to see when those things reprice and you know I know you mentioned at one point Chris about how people are feeling like they want to pay down their debt, but you've got a 2% loan, it makes no financial sense to pay it down. So what could you be doing in the meantime? I mean, just accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. And then when that loan resets, you have the option to pay some of it down if you need to. So that's what we're looking at in terms of navigating clients ahead. 
Uh, Todd, I want to switch gears a bit with you and Chris here and, and talk about the evolution and the role of the advisor. I know you mentioned at the top that you're focused on constructing more personalized portfolios for, for whatever reason, whether you're looking to get out of 60-40, find other you know, alternative ways to satisfy client demand. How do you see that evolving? Yeah, I, I, you know, I believe that there's a major disconnect in how we construct portfolios today and how we really understand what clients need. When you look at behavioral finance, you look at behavioral economics, and you look at the implications for how people respond to financial gain, how they respond to financial loss, right, it's well documented. We know how people are going to respond, and we see it every day. Right? You know, when the market's going up, people are just kind of numb to what's going on, right? But the second it goes down 5%, you know, you start seeing calls. And so people respond asymmetrically. And, you know, prospect theory is a huge basis for why that happens. And so what we have to do is we have to start taking a look at the portfolio construction process and we have to start matching that to how people are going to behave or respond. We have to start making that more adaptive. And then we have to use technology and tools on the front end to really start to understand how individuals perceive that, what biases influence our decisions, right? And biases aren't a negative thing, we all have them. It's just that we have to be aware of them, and as advisors, we have to be aware of what biases are influencing our clients and then adapt that construction process around that. So I say that we talk about 60-40s, the death of the 60-40, so to speak, but it's not, right? It has to do with, we have to have a bigger conversation of not just a stagnant portfolio, right? Or maybe whatever asset allocation is for people, but how we can change that portfolio construction process to be more dynamic for how people respond, you know, given that we know how that's gonna happen over time. I feel a lot of times, I, I never like to use the word that I'm a financial coach, but you know, I always tell people, hey, if you ever see a football game, you see all the players, you see all the coaches on the sidelines, sometimes as many times, as many coaches as there are players, and I'm like, I have done more financial coaching in the last two, two and a half years. Hey, you gotta stay in the game, turn the TV off, you know, please, because again, you know, negative news sells. And, and if you, you know, flip that around and say to people, wait a minute, you know, now we can get some kind of return on your safe money. We've always been in our shop big on having your risk, how big is your risk bucket, how, bi how big is your safety bucket, et cetera, and doing different strategies. But what I'm very excited about um, is I believe that we're on the next cusp, uh, again, using AI, artificial intelligence, where being able to have that conversation behaviorally with a client and saying, okay, here's what your portfolio looks like now, here's what you know, I'm suggesting, but by the way, this is what happened in you know, first half of 2020, this is what's happening now, and doing it more in real time, because everybody will nod and say, yes, I want that, until they get into the live fire exercise, and like you said, market's down 5% one day, and they're like, oh my gosh. So I think the value that we really, really add as an advisor is keeping people in the game. It's a long-term investment you know, strategy or process, and a lot of people get swayed and I used to have one client, unfortunately he's passed away, but we could always tell when it was time to buy in the stock market, he'd be the one that'd call up and go, get me out! And we're like, that, that was the bottom right there, okay. But behavioral science is becoming much, much more important. But how, you know, more importantly, how can we be more proactive and stay ahead of those calls that we know are gonna come? Because they don't That's know their the own question. risk tolerance. They don't they know. Don't. And, and I think it's a really important point that you make, because you can do your financial plan and do the projection and show the Monte Carlo, but you need to know when things go south, how they're going to respond. And when it's a new client, you don't really have that gauge. We can use our tools, our tech tools, to try to figure out how they're responding in those environments, but you don't know until you hit one. And so I think that the recency bias is a great example. People look back and they feel when a market's strong, you know, how are you, what's your risk tolerance? Oh, I'm aggressive. The market's down, what's your risk tolerance? I'm conservative. They don't know. And it's our job to kind of learn them and spend the human capital that we have as advisors to really get to know our clients and know what triggers them. Yeah. I beg to differ with you a little on that though because there's new technology out there and there are aspects that allow us to get to know clients much earlier on. We have to look outside the traditional tools that we use, right? Sure. And we have to start looking at more behavioral psych psych like psychology tools, right? Yes. And that's gonna allow us to understand clients at a much deeper level because ultimately, who we are, right? Our financial DNA doesn't change very much, right? right? And we revert back to that when we be, get introduced to stressful environments. Yes. And so how do we measure that? How do we dig deep into that? And there's tools that are being introduced today, as we spoke about tech earlier, mm -hmm. that allow us to dig deeper on that.
that in-depth psychological profile could be very valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Billions had it right with having a therapist on the staff. <laughs> All right, giving everyone 30 seconds as we wrap up here, Outlook for 2024. Again, we'll go around the table starting with Pete Corey. Well, I think, I'm sorry, I was just thinking about new investors and just how, um, you know, I think it's a challenge across the board to be educating. I think we're in a position of education right now. Um, and I think that's an exciting time. I think it's with technology and the long term and perspective and all the tools that we have. Um, but I think we're in a seat of education um, and being in close contact with clients and um, yeah, uh, being a partner for them, and that's really going to be key in 2024. Yeah, I and mean, of course, it's something that you and I have covered extensively. We'll get to you in a moment, but Tammy, your last 30 seconds. Yeah, um, I mean, going forward, just keeping clients balanced, not making any bets this year, um, trying to keep them at 50% leverage or less, and um, you know, focused on any variable debt and addressing that before before it's too late. And Chris, you know, you've been on with me for nearly seven years at this point, and I've seen your evolution in terms of how you manage and keep, you know, certainly through COVID, mm -hmm. and how you communicate with clients now. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're looking, you know, 2024, we're continuing, you know, putting our videos out to do the education, to talk about the market, you know, many of these things. Again, we came into 23 with a lot of people going, hey, we're gonna go into a recession. Well, maybe we do go in in 2024, but there's a lot of statistics out there that show that the equity markets tend to do pretty well through a recessionary period. And again, we now have an alternative in fixed income that we didn't have for li literally 15 years. So you can make your clients feel a little bit better at night by going, oh, okay, Mr. Smith, we're gonna put some of your money in a CD, but don't let them lose sight of the fact that we're trying to invest this for the long term. Yeah, I think when you look at my outlook, it's not so much market oriented, but it's industry oriented. We as an industry have to focus on the next gen clients and next gen advisors in a much bigger way because we have an aging population of advisors and we have an aging population of individuals and we're going to see that generational wealth transfer. So how do we service that next gen, not just focusing on them as the people are going to inherit the assets, but for what they need today and how we listen to what they need because it's very different than what their parents need. And so that's what our industry has to do a better job of. And we have to do a better job and understand that next gen advisor is going to need different tools and different upbringing than the upbringing that certain advisors who started in this business so many years ago had. And that's where, that's my outlook. Our industry has to do a better job of focusing on that yeah. if we're going to have longevity and continue to serve people the right way. All right. All right. I sense a new panel on this discussion <laughs> coming up. All right, panelists, appreciate you joining us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.